Today we're going to talk about two problems, uh, maybe one, depending on how, how time goes. Uh, called edit distance and also uh, matrix multiplication, chain multiplication. So let me, uh, let me start with edit distance. So, okay. Suppose you've all seen uh, something like this before, right? If you use GitHub and you make some changes, uh, it'll highlight your changes, uh, and then you do some commit message or something, right? But, but all these version control systems uh, are really quickly able to take like your snapshot of the code and the existing snapshot and quickly identify all the changes. Right? It doesn't really know anything about you, but it still does a pretty good job. So, so that's one thing, uh, and uh, and so Git is really based on this existing tool called uh, diff. Okay, so this is a command line tool, uh, and you can give it two files, and it'll give you basically exactly that highlighted thing. Okay, so this is a, a well-known thing. So uh, that's a basic thing uh, you want to be able to do is, I mean, not just be able to compare the files, but you want some reasonable, like, how are you even going to measure how different two files are, right? And what does it mean to give a good summary or a bad summary or something? Okay. So that's, that's one motivation. A second comes from, uh, from genetics. So, uh, so we're all made of these like DNA, right? Which is some kind of like computer code for us, right? Which is based on, uh, sequences of four letters, uh, A, C, G, and T. And uh, I guess the idea is that this sort of encodes all the information of how to make our proteins and how we get put together and, and so on and so forth. I'm, of course, not an expert. But uh, biologists and also computational biologists um, like to compare, you know, DNA of, of different uh, organisms uh, to try to figure out uh, things like how similar they are, right? So if you're trying to, like, uh, reconstruct sort of the evolutionary tree, then, you know, things that are closer in the tree should have more similar uh, DNA and things like this. Um, also, like, uh, you might have uh, two similar people, but one got sick and one not the other. So what's the difference? And, and maybe you try to find some differences if there happens to be a genetic explanation. So, so this will be another situation where, um, you know, people are interested in taking two strings in particular and trying to figure out how similar or different they are. Okay, so there's maybe, uh, there's more than two, but I'll discuss two uh, ways to measure similarity. So this one is uh, very prevalent in, in, for example, coding theory. It's called the Hamming distance. It's really only well defined for two strings of the same length. And the idea is that, you know, you have two strings of, of letters and you just go one by one and see how many are the same and how many are different. Okay. Sometimes you'll take the total difference and divide by the total length. So it becomes a number between zero and one. Sometimes you don't. So just to make sure uh, we're on the same page, what would be the hamming distance between these two strings? Four, so guessing you guys came up with the same one. So those last four characters uh, are all different, and that gets you the same distance of four. Okay, so this is really common in information science. Uh, a second metric, maybe it's more natural, right? Like imagine you're at a keyboard and you're typing. Right, and you roughly you're asking yourself how long would it take for me on a keyboard to change one string into another. So what's called edit distance is given these two strings, how many certain edit actions do I need to convert one to another? And an edit action is defined as either inserting one character, like say I'm going from A from X to Y, I'm either inserting a character to X, or I'm deleting a character from X, or I can replace one character with another. Okay, so single character um, edits, 
right? So, so here's the, the same two strings. What would be the edit distance between uh, these two? How many edits would I need to convert X into Y? Two, and they would, might be, what would be an example? All right, delete D and insert D later, All right? So that gets you some edit distance too. And just in this simple example, you can start to see some of the differences. I mean, indeed, all I did was move D to the end when I probably made these slides. It wasn't that different of a string. Hamming distance thinks this is like more than 50% wrong. Edit distance thinks, oh, there's only a very small adjustment. So, okay. So both of these things, especially for Hamming distance, if you focus on strings of the same length, uh, both of these will define what's called a metric on strings. Um, that's like Euclidean distance or something. Do people know the, the formal requirements of a metric? Uh, Non-negativity, which one is that the second one? No, okay, now I'm negative this first one. So it's some kind of like distance. So every value needs to be greater than or equal to zero. And especially if it's a strict metric, if the distance is zero, then they should be the same points, right? So if two strings had Hamming distance zero, every character must match. Likewise, with edit distance, if there was zero edit distance, they're the same. Uh, other, what are some other like uh, rules defining a metric? A triangle inequality. So uh, the distance from A to B, or if you're trying to go from A to B, then it's at most going from A to C and C to B, because that's one way to get from A to B, right? So uh, Hemming, you can look at directly for, for edit distance, right? If I'm trying to take X and edit it into Y, if I'm able to take X and edit it into Z, and then take Z and edit it into Y, well, th that combination, doing one after another, gives me some kind of edit sequence from x to y. And, and the edit distance is the minimum of all sequences. Okay? Uh, there's one more rule. Symmetry. So edit distance from a to b is equal to edit distance from b to a. Okay? So this is, this is very nice. But, I mean, what's really nice is that sort of your maybe geometric intuition uh will kind of work right you now sort of have like a geometry over the space of of strings and then you know if you're doing some kinds of analysis then this is very valuable yeah this is a def this is the definition of metric so a metric is over some space x it's some function taking pairs of inputs and assigning assigning real values uh with subject to these rules that's all but you know like euclidean distance also satisfies these rules so it's more of a comment okay so i tried to set up sort of uh, pros and cons uh this just to compare the two so um yeah i would say maybe there's one drawback in particular about Hamming distance, and that's this basic issue of if you just like lose one character in the middle, like the Hamming distance just gets destroyed, right? So just a small misalignment, like moving D from the beginning to the end throws off everything, which happens a lot. You're writing code, you take your line of code and you bring it down to the bottom, right? The Hamming distance is completely different, but you just copy and paste or cut and paste one line. Same with DNA, right? Like, like some weird photon from the sun like hits a had hits a gene and just it just gone and now everything shifted and it's off so it's a bit brittle because of this alignment issue the good thing though is that it's very easy to define it's very fast to compute you just go through one by one so that's great uh edit distance can you know kind of handle misalignment and and I think for many applications, not all applications, but for many applications, edit distance is maybe closer to our intuitive notion of difference between two strings. I think that's the case for like source code, certainly. Um, but the con and what we really need to address 
you know, it's, it's a little bit more complicated because a definition is like the minimum over all possible ways to do something. And it's not clear we can compute this very efficiently. Right, so it has very nice modeling properties, um, but the issue is algorithmic, and that's, that's our focus today. Okay. All right, so we're going to try to come up with a recursive algorithm for edit distance, which always starts with the same first step. And that's, let's just define the thing that we're trying to implement so that when I do my recursive subcalls, I know what I'm getting. Okay, so, uh, right, so, you know, the input might consist of two strings, but who wants to propose maybe M and N? Who wants to propose a definition? I'll give it a name, edit. Yeah. Sure, I mean, it's not really so much about being comparable, they're just strings this time. Comparable is more important for sorting, but you know, given two strings, x, y, and I guess, I don't know, maybe edit distance well-defined, or I'll just define it here, return, and we're gonna focus on the number of edits as opposed to the actual sequence. Okay. Return a minimum number of edits to convert x to y. That would be maybe a relatively long one. Okay. That's just the first step. It gets us started. And in this case, you know, it's not really so different than the problem that was given to you. Soon we'll get more interesting examples. Okay, fine. Most important step is now done. All right, let's implement this. We've already done the hardest part. get the first line started, but what comes after that? Or what, what are the easiest situations to work with? Okay, uh, if x is equal to y, so I guess you would have to verify everything. So I'll put a comma here, this takes o m plus n time, then return zero. Zero is the lo lowest, and it is true that it takes zero, so that actually must be the right answer. Okay, that's one possibility. What else? Yeah. Yeah, they could be unequal. Okay, so, uh, okay, I'll do it slowly. So if m, which is referring to the first length, if m is zero, then, yeah, return n. And if n is, e is zero, I guess I could have put one equal sign there. We're not that strict. If n is zero, then return M. Okay, so we've really addressed the two cases where one string or the other is empty, in which case you just have to insert a bunch or delete a bunch. Okay, um, good. So now you have two non-empty strings. You're trying to figure out how to edit, right? It's not obvious. You're trying to get the best possible, no matter what, way to do edit. And don't worry about any running time issues. We just want to get an algorithm that even takes exponential time. Say that one more time. Okay, so, well, okay, so let's look at, at some level, we're just trying to figure out how to make some progress, right? So, you know, there's more. Okay. Um, 
So an okay place to start is to look at the first characters of the, the two strings. So let's start with, okay, let's, why does it do that? Okay, so if, suppose they're not equal. And that's one case, they're either equal or not equal, right? So if they're not equal, what should I do, right? Like maybe this is X, this is Y, A is not equal to B. Uh, okay, so this could be, okay. Um, one plus edit on the rest of the strings. So this would, I guess, correspond to a substitution where you're just replacing the first character of one with the other. Sorry? Oh, oh no, a substitution counts as one. I, no, you can do insertion, deletion, or substitute, or like replace character. Sorry. So you have those three operations. Okay, so certainly you can like replace A with B. But even in this example, does it look like you should? It seems like, well, you at least want to consider, you know, of course you don't know what's down here, so maybe, but nonetheless, it's not obvious that you should substitute just because you can, right? So this is a valid possibility, but it's not clear that substituting is the best possibility, right? Maybe you want to insert and maybe you want to delete. So the question is, how do we figure out which one to do? Yeah. Okay, so like based on that example, we can do something like, we can do something like uh, if x2 uh, is equal to y1 maybe yeah. then uh i guess you want to delete the first character from x or something then return one plus edit i guess two y sorry it, it, let me make it a little bigger um or more legible, one plus edit. Do you want to go from the second character of X to the end and keep all of Y, right? You're hoping to match that? Yeah. Yeah, so I think part of the issue is, yeah, we could start looking at this and we could start playing this kind of game of like, oh, if the second character is matched, I always just do this or what themes kind of make sense. But I don't think it'll be hard to come up with an example where I trick you into matching these two next, but then you wish you had done something else, right? And in general, we're, we're in a situation where we're trying to make sort of a short-term decision, but we don't know the long-term consequences. Right, it's really hard for uh, we can come up with these rules ad infimum, and I'll never be able to really justify any of these things. Thus, right, let's just worry about getting it correct first. Right, the simplest way to get it correct is to try everything. Right, you have to as soon as I know these two are different, I have to do something. I have to either substitute or insert B or delete A. I don't know which one's best, but I know one of the three has to happen. So let's just try all of them. So what does uh, all of them look like? We could return the minimum of, so one is the substitute, which we had earlier. Edit x2 to m, y2 to n. Or I can try deleting 
which will go from, that means I'm going to get rid of one character from X and keep Y the same. That's a 1, and above it, that's supposed to be a 2. They look the same. Sorry. Or I can insert a character at the beginning of X, which will match Y. So that lets me advance Y by 1. Edit X 1 to M, Y 2 to N. Now, obviously, this is going to be problematic writing-wise because you're branching off three times and only, but we'll come back to that later. At the very least, it's correct algorithm. It'll get you the right answer because you're just trying everything. It's brute force, you know, in, in a recursive form, right? And, and so likewise, we can look at uh, what happens if, if x1 is equal to y1. All right, what if x1 is equal to y1? Yeah, so it seems obvious that you should match them and then just move on. Um, but then you would afterwards need to write a proof, you know, pointing out the obvious. So I'm super lazy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just, okay, you can either match them, which seems like the common sense thing to do. But every time I try to prove this, I can never do it that slickly. It's always cumbersome. I find it easier to say, okay, you can either match them or you can insert and delete. I don't know why, but I'm just going to be conservative algorithmically. Okay, so this is sort of a secondary point. And I'm not going to be too clever. Um, and and if they're equal, I'll either keep them the same and advance both pointers, or I'll just test out an insertion and deletion anyway, in case for some reason you want to match. I don't know why. OK. But the very least, it's very easy to see why this is correct. Because again, it's just trying everything. Okay. All right, so that's all we have here. So this is just a, uh, a brute force algorithm. OK, so what is the running time of our algorithm? First, let's model this. How would I model the running time? So t of n will be the upper bound on the running time for size for, uh, yeah, I guess n total characters. k plus l is equal to n. Six of t n minus one plus constant work. Uh, can anyone do why, why six? Because there's six recursive calls. Ah, either way, you're only doing three, so it's actually three. But if you start unrolling this, then you're going to get you know your o one plus three times three t n minus two plus O1, and so forth, OK? And if you work that all the way through, you're going to get 1 plus 3 plus 9, all the way up to 3 to the n. So our running time is actually kind of exponential. As you might imagine, we're just trying everything in the brute force algorithm. But it's correct. So we're making some progress. So let me, let me summarize the state of affairs. So. I tried to argue that edit distance is useful. And, uh, and we can at least compute it recursively. So we do have an algorithm. Uh, and it's clearly correct because it's trying everything. I mean, we can do the proof by induction, but. And the only issue is that the recursive algorithm is exponential time. Yeah. Yeah, so whenever you have anything like a different example, something like this, i equal 1 to k of like 2 to the i, 2 plus 4 plus 8 plus 16, and you add them all up, it's going to be dominated by the biggest term. That's 2 to the k. 
same with three, same with four, anything bigger than one. Okay. But this is, this, is, this is actually not a unique situation. You find something that's clearly useful. You know how to do it exactly recursively in a brute forces fashion. The only issue is that you, it takes a long time. So there's sort of a conceptual question here, bigger than just edit distance. How can you take this recursive algorithm and make it fast? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I want even more common sense word, terms. Yeah. So what does each entry correspond to? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, so I want it. But if you take even a step back, right, what are you really doing? For each of your sub problems, you're doing what? Yeah, okay. So do, yeah, I think what you guys are saying, so there's a simpler word, right? We're just going to save our answers. Don't worry too much about the exact representation. Okay, we're going to do what all computer scientists do when their algorithm is too slow. Just going to throw caching at it, okay? And we're going to see, okay, it feels like there's some redundancy here, right? Like, oh, I start at the beginning of the string and I'm kind of chipping away, but I keep encountering the same subproblems again and again over all those recursive calls. So you're doing a lot of repeated work, okay? So we're going to explore, oh, what happens if I just save my answers? And how much does that buy me? Okay, but otherwise this formula is super generic. I can get a, a recursive algorithm easily, but the algorithm is slow. I'm just going to pad my recursion with a layer of caching. Okay. It's almost common sense. So, okay, so what are the ideas? Um, what are the ideas? Okay. Here are our two principles. So we have these subproblems, right? We've defined them clearly with a recursive spec. That's important. And we're just going to save the answers to each subproblem the first time we solve it. And we'll just never solve the same subproblem twice. So we're just going to use memory. That's it. So, okay. Let's see. So just as a warm up, it's not super important, but I'm going to take what we just did and just re-index it in a way that makes it easier to imagine saving the answers. Okay, this was sort of what was alluded to. So I'm going to do something like this. I'm going to rewrite our recursive spec a little bit. I'll define X and Y and, and cleanly establish them outside the sentence. And then in here, I'll just say I, J will be, oh, I'm comparing X, I to M to X to Y, J to M. Okay, X and Y are established outside the sentence. So this is well defined. And if we rewrite the, the code we came up with in terms of I and J, now it's just going to look like this. You know, if these are both empty strings, then return this. If one's empty, return that. Um, and in here, oh, this should be XI is not equal to YJ. If XI is not equal to YJ, then here I'm trying all three choices. One, advance i, 1 plus advance j, 1 plus advance both. Okay. This is the same as before. It's only for convenience for the next stage. Okay. And so what you could do, you know, what's a, how would you save the answers? I mean, I'm too lazy. I don't even use an array, right? I just like put this in a dictionary, a hash map. And uh, I, let's see, is this maybe blurry? Let me zoom in. Okay. Uh, I guess I set up an M by N array, but it could be a hash map. It doesn't matter. So when I get to one of these interesting subproblems, right? Like uh, if X I is not equal to Y J, same typo from before, right? But when you get to this subproblem, let's see if we solved it first. 
So the array will initially be like all null values or something or negative one, maybe marks that it's not solved yet. So I'll check to see if I've saved an answer. If not, then I'll solve it and then I'll save it. And then I'll return the save value. Same was down here. Okay, so all I'm doing is saving it in a table, in a hash map, in an array, whatever you want to call it. I'm not too concerned. Okay. And then that's the whole algorithm. It's the same algorithm as before. Nothing has changed. So there's no issue of correctness. In fact, I should point out it's actually probably more confusing to try to figure out why this is correct because there's this layer of saving that has nothing to do with correctness. And I guess I have the same slide again. Anyway, so that's, that's the algorithm, right? I'm just taking what we had before. Oops. And uh, adding this layer of caching. So before we had an exponential time algorithm because it's just doing brute force, how long will this algorithm take? So how would I, how would I, well, how, how does one go about figuring out the running time? How does one break it down? Yeah, so we're going to break down the running time a little differently than before. So we only solve each subproblem once, right? So if we can figure out how many subproblems there are and how much time I'm spending on each subproblem, excluding the recursive subber problems, right? That'll give me a total running time. So it's just it's aggregating in a different way than we've done before. How many subproblems are there? M n. So you have uh, strings of length m and n, and those are all the choices of i and j. You just have to look at your recursive spec to find this. And how much time? do we spend on each recursive subproblem, excluding the recursive calls? Constant time. So if you already have these values, this is a recursive call, but if you already have these values, the, the rest is just like comparing three numbers and stuff like that. So all together, you get an MN running time, right? So, so adding caching, saving your answers, took your exponential running time, and turn it into a pretty decent polynomial time algorithm. In fact, we have reason now to believe that you can't actually do faster than this. If you did like, uh, if you did much faster by a polynomial factor, then we'll get a, a much faster than brute force algorithm for a problem called SAT. That'll come up later. Yeah. Anyway, it's kind of interesting. Um, uh, so we think we think this is actually best possible for this particular problem. Uh, yeah. But what I want to point out is that this is really a really simple brute force algorithm with a trick thrown on top to make it fast. Like it's obviously correct. So, although you're not allowed to write obviously correct. Okay. Uh, so, so this is sometimes called dynamic programming, which is a name that means nothing. And, uh, and the real key idea is that if you get a good recursive spec, and you recognize that there's a limited number of subproblems, m by n in the in the previous case, then you automatically have a polynomial time algorithm by saving your answers. Okay, so so once you have a good kind of uh, recursive spec that that understands the certain compactness, it's very hard to get the rest wrong, or if you do, it'll be in detailed ways like base case or something, right? So so uh, we have like a very rigid set of of steps that we'll always use for this kind of problem. Yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. So, so, um, so in this sentence, I've sort of declared and defined a subproblem in my recursive spec. The minimum number of edit operations to convert that suffix to that suffix. And i and j are only the indices in the string, so that's how we get m by n. And in our algorithm, once we added the saving, we'll never solve the same subproblem twice. So our running time just becomes total number of subproblems times times a constant in this case. But by the time you've gotten this sentence, you've actually like completely decomposed the structure of the problem. Like you, yeah. So this is what I refer to by by subproblems. Yeah, or inputs to recursive calls. Yeah. 
oh, well, we can just look. So remember here, you're just doing like one comparison and then you're uh, comparing three numbers and taking the minimum. So all of this is constant work. There's nothing, there's no loops in here and we're excluding recursive calls, right? The recursive calls is accounted for in the other sub problems. That's it. There's just no loops. Because uh, uh, three times TN minus one, I don't have to pay TN minus one because now I'm saving the answer. So it's not doing this deep recursive. And if you, if you think about it, it's just, uh, you know. So once this is already computed once, then it's just gonna look it up in a table and take constant time. So, okay. Um, So, I mean, this is not like, like using memory, computer memory in a smart way is always simpler in hindsight. It's not like that obvious of a thing. Uh, so we'll get a lot of practice. All right, the six steps, please follow them. The rubrics will like assign points to every one of the six steps, okay? One, as always, define the recursive spec, okay? You know, your first guess should probably be restating the problem, and you might find that you need to change it, okay? But if you get this right, it's very hard to mess up the rest. I mean, if, at least if you're careful. So the first step is to, is, to, is to define the recursive spec, and then you can start implementing it. And if you find that you are not able to implement your spec, the issue might be you need to change your spec. We'll have some examples that make this more clear. Like sometimes you wanna add parameters or strengthen the sentence in some way so that your recursive subcalls kind of have more to work with, okay? But that should be your sort of like feedback loop. You try to figure out what you're trying to implement and then if you can't implement it, maybe you need to refigure out what you're trying to implement. Not, not so much an issue down here. Okay, that's, that's step two. Uh, and just give the recursive implementation. Don't build a table. That just makes it harder to understand what's going on. That first code, the very simple code for edit distance, that's what we're looking for, okay? And then don't write any code about loops and building tables or nonsense. Just say, I'm gonna cache my solutions or I'm gonna use dynamic programming, okay? So if you like go to certain websites, you will get the loops and stuff and I can't read those. Like they make no sense to me, okay? The, rec the recursive implementation done correctly was a good spec. It should be obvious and clear like why your algorithm's correct. And it's just a mechanical thing to save your answer. There's nothing interesting there. Okay, so give me that code that's obviously correct. And then just say you're gonna save the answers and that's good enough. No reason to like rewrite the code twice as long. And then analyze the running time. That's usually sub problems times work per sub problem. How to use the recursive algorithm to solve, this doesn't seem very interesting for edit distance, but sometimes it'll be more interesting. So for us, we would say, oh, I would return edit one, one. That gives me the edit distance to the original problem. Okay, so edit one, one would be X one to M and Y one to N. And that's what you're originally looking for. So just one quick sentence, that's often easy. And then, and this is also often kind of cookie cutter, but ultimately the correctness comes from induction. Okay, so your algorithm works because it's doing the subproblems correctly and your recursive spec is your inductive hypothesis. Okay, so I think on the homework, we'll occasionally ask you to actually, I mean, by default, you should do it unless you're not asked to. And then I think on the test, because time is more limited, we, we do something like, we're just gonna treat your recursive spec as your inductive hypothesis and just fill in the rest, right? Because there's not time to like write the usual long thing. So, so really, if you just did a recursive spec, a lot of other things follow. It means you understand what's going on at a high level, right? You're able to break down the problem in a top-down fashion. So those are, those are the six steps. And, uh, and we also have like sample solutions and stuff that you can pattern after. Okay, so, so just to make this point uh, really clear, because this is, uh, I mean, the people who probably won't follow this aren't here, that's okay. Um, so don't give me any code implementing caching. Don't give any loops. There's nothing interesting about it. 
yeah, don't none of this iterative code. So don't just copy from from leak code or something. Those solutions are wrong. Uh, they're morally wrong. They're often actually wrong. And then I, I'm not too concerned with how much space you use. Okay, there are some problems where instead of filling out the whole table, you can be clever and like only save some of the solutions. But I don't care. If we just focus on this and get that down, that's pretty good. Just try to get the the correctness down correctly. Running time is more important than space usage. The very least, the space usage is always at most the running time because you can only write one thing each step. Okay. So I'm not going to worry too much about that. Um, and I guess here was a, a sample solution uh, that I wrote up. You know, just a spec, quick implementation, edit one one is what we're looking for. Running time, we did this together. And then proof, we prove by induction at a fast size recursive spec. It's often not that interesting. Okay. Um, but that's it. So so those and just like clearly label it, right? This is one, this is two, make the grader's life easy. Okay. Simple enough. Okay, I guess we have time to to try to do this. Um in general, yeah, it's going a little fast, so I think we'll fill in some classes with extra practice or something. This is just the awkwardness from doing 50 minute classes instead of 80. So here's a second application that we're going to try to use similar technique. So uh, this is about multiplying two matrices. Okay, so a matrix is uh, a grid of numbers. Uh, so this would be like N1 rows and N2 columns, it's like an Excel spreadsheet. Okay, and in matrix multiplication, you're going to take two matrices where um, the number of columns here is going to match the number of rows in the second one. And if I look at like this ij entry, it's going to be taking the dot product of the ith row of the first and the jth row of the second, like a zipper. It's going to multiply and add them up. Okay, so the formula is up there. And it'll do this for all of the things. So you end up with this. Uh, Loop n1 times n3 comes from, oh, that's how many coordinates I create in the output. And for each of these coordinates, you're doing this, this zipping action along n2 numbers. So n1 times n2 times n3. Okay. So, okay. Now, when you have something like this, you have three matrices being multiplied together, and you can only multiply two at a time. You actually have some choices. So, so the output size is completely fixed. It'll be n3 times n1. Oh, sorry, n4 times n1 times n4. But um, you could choose to multiply the first two together first or the second two together first. Which one would you rather do? The second two? Okay, let's see. Okay, so, oops. What did I do? Okay, so first if I multiply the first two together, okay, so that's going to give me uh, something like this. So the first two, the outer dimensions, will give me this big square, and the, the third matrix remains. And, uh, and so that will give me... Uh, n1, n2, n3, plus n1, n3, n4 from the second one. That'll give you this quantity. Whereas if we have multiplied the second two together first, then your intermediate step looks very different. The second one is actually much smaller as drawn. And so your sum is going to come out like, uh, oops, um, like this n2, n4 times n1 plus n3. So depending on the values of your n's, one choice may be much faster than the other. Okay. So, so our goal is you're going to be given this, this sequence, a bunch of matrices, and you want to figure out how to put parentheses around things, multiplying two at a time to minimize the total number of operations. Okay. So a solution might look something like this. Okay. So, okay. 
we're going to, not as much time for ideas. I'll try to, to make sure we cover this. And in the, in the time we save, we can do another example later or something. But I'll try to finish this story today. It's probably better than splitting it up. So we're going to try to come up with a recursive algorithm for this problem. And that comes, starts with, of course, defining a subproblem. Does anyone want to suggest a subproblem? Yeah. You no, know, we don't start with the base case. We start with the sentence. OK, let's do this. All right, I'll call it molt. I'm trying to multiply. What are the inputs? Okay. Well, I guess, yeah, you really need uh, I'll write it like this. Something like this. But really, you're interested in the dimensions. So what are you trying to do? All right, minimum number of operations to put this all together. OK, uh, I guess I wrote fastest. Now, and I put it between i and j. OK, so OK, maybe we can try to go through the, the implementation in the remaining time. It'll be a little bit quick, but um, OK, so if I wanted to implement this, what would be a base case? Okay. If i is equal to j, return 0. Okay. If j is equal to i plus 1, return whatever is the, that calculation. All right, so the interesting case is that there's more than two matrices. Okay, so you other size you're saying return uh, the better of uh, I guess fastest i plus one j plus multiplying the first two, so that's going to be something like n i n i plus one n i plus two the three dimensions if it's the indexing is correct, or you trim off the last one, j minus 1 plus, I guess, n j minus 1, n j, n j. I might be slightly off by 1. The n's are referring to the indices of the, the corresponding matrices. Um, OK, so you're going to try to multiply 1 from the n's. Does everyone agree? OK. Well, you have to actually be a little bit careful because you may want to put your parentheses somewhere in the middle, right? You might want to do something like this. You don't necessarily want to just multiply the leftmost one in or the rightmost one in, right? So this one's actually a little bit tough because actually what you're going to do is going to figure out the last two matrices. You'll, you know, you have 10 matrices, and the idea is I'm going to try to split them into two parts. Like maybe the first five and the last five, and then figure out how to do the two parts best possible, and then multiply them together. Okay, so this one is a little bit trickier. It's not obvious how to break it down correctly. Okay, so what this is doing instead is it's looking for a middle matrix index to actually split it in half, and then here's the first half, here's the second half. And then you're going to get sort of that middle dimension from the two halves times that leftmost dimension times that rightmost dimension. Okay. And this is kind of clearly correct, but you can be more careful with induction. Okay. So, so sometimes it's not obvious how to break this down. And so I'll just speed, speed run through this. So at the end of the day, you want to return the fastest way to multiply the first and the last matrix. So that's that step. Let's just quickly go over the running time, and then we're done. So 
we'll just do the same subproblems times time per subproblem approach. How many subproblems are there? N squared, if there's n matrices. Uh, I guess K, I should have wrote N maybe. I'll, I'll stick with N. So N squared, and how much time per subproblem? So how much, what's an upper bound? So this is J minus I, how do I upper bound J minus I? What's the biggest it could be? And let me do this correctly. Next one will also be goofed up. Yeah, assuming there's n matrices, I think I had avoided using n because those were dimensions, but as long as we're on the same page, you multiply this together and you get an n cubed time algorithm where n is a number of input matrices. A little confusing because I also use n for dimensions. Okay, so that is uh, a little faster than probably ideal to go through it, but now we can do a different example in the time we save, but that would be an n cubed algorithm to, to break down kind of how to get the best sequence of matrix multiplications to minimize your running time, okay? All right, we'll get a lot of practice. Really the best way to do this is to get practice and yeah, you've got plenty on the homework and I'll end there. So I want to continue last time's lecture because we really didn't spend as much time as I would like because the classes are a little bit shorter. So I picked out a, one problem. It's sort of related to the homework that we could go through together. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe let me first introduce the problem and then I'm going to recap what we did and then we'll think a little bit. I want to give you guys a chance to also think about it and try. So have some scratch paper ready. But we'll do the first one, which maybe you've seen before. The standard problem. So you're given a, a sequence of numbers. 1, 5, 3, 2, 11, 6, 7, or something, I don't know. And uh, you want to find a subset, a subsequence of them, not a consecutive subsequence. You could skip some. So that the numbers are, are increasing. So for example, if you did like a one, if you went like one, two, six, and seven, that would be a strictly increasing subsequence. One, two, six, and seven. I don't know if that's the best one you can do. Can anyone do better than four? Okay. Probably four is correct. I don't know. So that's going to be our goal. So you're going to be, in general, given n numbers, and you're going to find a strictly increasing subsequence. And, and as you'll see on the homework, there's an infinite number of these something something subsequence problems that are going to follow something of a similar structure. So this will give, you know, one example to get you going. So I want to remind us, I put the template here, but maybe I'll scroll up to, so we can remember what we were doing. So we want to try to do this essentially recursive algorithm plus caching to make the algorithm fast. Okay, so for example, uh, most, of last, most of the time last class, we talked about edit distance. So edit distance, the idea was uh, you want to find a minimum number of changes to turn one string into another. And the steps we went through to make a recursive algorithm was first, oh, let's just define what we're trying to do, you know, get that set up. Then we implemented it. Uh, this is a little messy. Uh, I guess here's pseudocode. What, one thing, an interesting feature about our implementation is that it wasn't actually very clever at all. Like, you know, we, we were exploring, oh, if the first letters aren't different, should you look at the second letter or third letter or something, you know, possible ideas like that. Eventually we abandoned the idea and just say, you know what, just try what would happen if you deleted or if you tried inserting or you tried substituting and then just recursively figure out the consequence and choose the best afterwards, right? So this was actually a very conservative sort of brute force algorithm, clearly trying everything, right? So the nice thing is that correctness was, was relatively straightforward, 
But the obvious issue is running time. If you don't do anything, this is going to take exponential time. Oops. So the question was, how do I take this otherwise clean, correct algorithm and make it fast? And the basic idea is like, well, it feels like I'm resolving uh, the same problem over and over again. For example, if I like do, a, I guess, deletion followed by an insertion, then I'll be left with 2-2. Two, two. I mean, you know, the second letter onwards or something. Or if I did a substitution right away, it would be second letter onwards. But the point is that I, many different recursive paths come across the same subproblem again and again and again. And every time you solve the subproblem, it's going to be the same answer. The input's the same. The sentence is clearly defined. So let's just not do that and save our answers, right? So that was that was basically uh, uh, the idea. Uh, we're going to just save the answers to every one of these subproblems defined by two suffixes of our input. And we're just going to make sure we don't solve the same subproblem twice. So this is sometimes called caching or dynamic programming. And then so here we create some table called A, A for answer. And we just kind of take our nice clean recursive algorithm and wrap it with something to check to see if I've already computed the answer before. If I have, then I can just return it. If not, then I'll compute save it before returning. It's totally mechanical. So in fact, we'll never want to see code that looks like this. The previous code, where the point is just the correctness, is what we'll look for. And beyond this point, we just expect you to say, oh, I'll take this recursive algorithm and throw caching on top instead of like actually. So no loops, none of this stuff. Don't copy from the internet, the internet's wrong. Why is the running time so great now? Before it was exponential. But now that I'm making sure I don't solve the same problem more than once, okay? So if you've already solved it, it's just constant time. So if I want to figure out how much total time I'm spending, I'm just going to count the number of subproblems and multiply it with the number of amount of time I spend per subproblem. Here we had mn subproblems, length m, length n. And then just constant time because, oh, I'm just you know trying three things, comparing three numbers. It's not so much work excluding the recursive subcars. Okay, so this is like a very nice recipe to a very good algorithm, right? It was easy for us to see why I was correct at that recursive stage was a good, clean sentence. And then we just did this saving answer trick, and suddenly you have a good polynomial time algorithm. And in fact, we have good reason to believe you can't do better for this problem. So, right, so the, the steps, right, that we ask for, the most important thing is getting the sentence down. Then you implement it. And you might find if you are having, having trouble implementing this, Instead of just hacking away at number two, go back up to number one, and maybe you need to strengthen your sentence, right? Because your sentence gives you your subroutine, your subproblem. So sometimes if you actually do more, which seems harder, you have a stronger tool on your subproblems. And we'll, we'll explore some, some examples. And then once, between these two, it should be clear, if you get it right, that the algorithm's correct. To make it fast, you just say, oh, I'm going to use dynamic programming, and then you calculate the running time, probably similarly to what we did. And beyond that, you know, which recursive call will you use to return the answer? That's not super motivated yet, but, you know, for us, it would have been edit 1-1, one, one, because that's, that's the edit distance between the whole two strings. And then uh, in a quick proof by induction, but it's more or less if you have the right recursive spec, it's almost cookie cutter. Right? Because you're just saying, oh, I'm going to prove my algorithm implements this spec by induction on the size, and if it does the subproblems correct, then you should. Okay. So, with that in mind, I'll give you a little time to look at this, and I've allocated some space. So, we're going to look at, again, this longest increasing subsequence problem. I put the other problems up in case you race to finish fast. You can get a head start on your homework. Um, but I give you an array of numbers, and the goal is to find the length of the longest increasing subsequence. Okay, so just a subset, a subsequence. It can skip, it doesn't have to be consecutive, but it needs to be as long as possible. So I thought uh, I can give you guys a few minutes to, to try it once. If you have scratch paper, great. Uh, you guys can talk to each other, have fun quickly make homework groups for the deadline tonight or something. I don't know, whatever you want. 
but I was going to give you guys a few minutes to try it and then we'll do it together uh, or go through some sketch of us of a thing together and make sure we're on the same page. Sound good? Okay. And then if you have any questions, just raise, I'll walk around and, and answer. Let's, uh, let's start discussing together. Looks like I mean, some are done, some aren't, but that's okay. Um, well, actually first, one thing I noticed, uh, how many of you are carrying any kind of either notebook or scratch paper or anything to write down something in your backpack? Oh, and you just didn't use it? Okay. All right. I wasn't sure if it was like fully, uh, okay. If I had to give one, one piece of advice in this class, it's like, use lots of scratch paper get used to writing things down and exploring ideas on paper because the goal is to sort of be able to do things that we can't just do in our head right that's much more exciting than than the things that already fit in our head so part of part of this class is i mean part of the reason we do proofs or something is 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 you know we want to eventually get to a point where we could do things that we don't even believe except we've proven it to ourselves and stuff like that right so that's like a a next step but also you just need to write down and and explore and and you don't really know if you're right or wrong until you commit to something written down. Okay, that's one I just have tons of scratch paper. If you want, I can always steal paper from the printers for you. I just unlock it, just grab a stack. Okay. All right, so let's start writing stuff. So so here's the problem. What should I write first? All right. So we need some kind of sentence, right? We're going to make a recursive algorithm. I'll write LIS for longest increasing subsequence, but what should my parameters be? Parameter, parameters. Okay, I, J, and what would this be? What, what are we trying to do? The length of the longest, I'll just abbreviate since I'm in front of the class, uh, from AI to AJ. So maybe in A, I to J. Okay. Is that what everyone did? Did anyone have a different sentence? Yeah. Okay, so another one. Longest increasing subsequence I is the length of the longest increasing subsequence starting from AI to N. Anyone else? Okay. Well, we have to proceed with one. Who wants to do the first one? Okay. And who wants to do the second one? Okay, so we'll go with the second one. Okay, so this sort of makes sense, right? I've given some N numbers, and my subsequences or my subproblems will be suffixes. Right, and at the end of the day, I want to get LIS one. That's the longest increasing subsequence of the whole thing. So let's now try implementing this. Why does it do that? All right, LIS i. Right, the length, the longest increasing subsequence. And how might I implement this? What's the first step? All right, what are some base cases? Okay, if i is n, return 1. Yeah, sometimes I'm, I just be extra careful. Sometimes I also write if i is bigger than n, return 0. If it's past n, that's like an empty array. Okay, so those are our base cases. Okay, I agree. If there's one left, then the length of the longest one is one. All right, so in the interesting case, i is less than n. There's at least two letters left. Okay, so tell me if this is what you have in mind. You want to return the maximum of, 
I guess L I S J over G uh, J going from I plus one up to N. And then you said something else, but not all J's, right? Such that a j is at least a oh, what did I do a i okay because it needs to be increasing is that is that what some everyone got or something similar oh one plus okay so so. Okay, so this seems to be assuming we use I. Okay, so uh, okay, so that's one option. So one option is we sort of use I. And what would another option be then? We don't use I. I'm gonna... Goodbye, other sentence. Okay, so the other option is is when we don't use I. So this is a little bit informal. I'll just write or <laughs> max of. And so how would I implement not using I? Something like this. Oh. There's two maxes, and I'll return the maximum of the two two maxes. Sorry, I didn't want to rewrite the whole thing. Okay. So assuming, yeah, it's a little bit sloppy, but assuming we all know what I mean, the idea is, okay, I have two options. I can either use I, and then I'll look for something bigger, or I won't use I, and I'll just try everything beyond. And I'll return the max of those two. So it should really be to return the maximum of the maximum of this and the maximum of this. Okay, so, uh, all right, are we happy with this code? No, who said no? Okay, you're not happy, why? Okay, so if I don't want to use I, Oh, oh, you're saying I don't even have to do this. I could alternatively, uh, like, okay, so you're saying not, if I don't use I, then it's the same as just calling LIS I plus one, which should capture the other cases, at least as defined, if we're looking at the longest increasing. Okay, so we can do that. So I'll replace this with Okay, now are we happy? Okay, now here's, uh, so let's say what we're saying. Okay, the longest increasing subsequence from AI to N. So, okay, so let's look at this. I, I use I, right? And I'm gonna try these J's bigger and I'm gonna ask for the longest increasing subsequence starting from AJ. Will that actually give me the longest increase? Well, is there any issue there? What's the bottom? Well, you do compare. I mean, this will be the max of this or this. Is that what you mean? That's okay. I'm actually worried about an issue of correctness. The median number? Yeah, okay, so sure, uh, but this, this will kind of do the comparison for everything that's even bigger. I'm actually not too worried about running time, yeah. Um, 
Um, well, okay, so even if J is a bad choice, you know, there may be a good choice. I mean, you know, we do try all J, so it should test out the small numbers in the middle. Is that, yeah. So let me give let me let me give a, an example and you guys see if this inspires something. Suppose the input looked like starting from i, it was like five, seven, one, two, three, four. Okay, so this is like the ith index, so maybe i is one or something. Maybe this is what you mean. So suppose I have i, right? And I'm gonna check all the j's that are bigger. So we'll try j to be the second index, because that's bigger, that's seven. And I say, oh, what's the length of the longest increasing C subsequence starting from 7? What is the length of the longest increasing subsequence starting from 7? 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. So it'll return 4. And you'll add it on to the 5 for 1 point, and you'll return 5. Right? So our, our sub-problem, see here you're saying, oh, you're acting like you're going to use J. But LISJ does not force you to use j. It just asks for the length of the longest increasing subsequence starting from j, right? Which may not use the 7. OK, so it's tricky, yeah. So our algorithm is going to return the number 5. It'll say that the long, length of the longest increasing subsequence is 5. Sure, we'll remove it. That, that's fine. So even if I return the maximum of LIS 1 through 6, it's still going to be realized from starting from here, right? This will return 5. Yeah, so so overall, so so you have some driver that returns the maximum over all i of LIS i, right? That's saying, oh, you can start from anywhere. So even if, if I wrap this particular code that we worked out together with this function, it will return the answer 5 because 1 plus... Yeah. So so it's going to go here. Oh, okay. That's what you're saying. Uh, oh, okay. Well, let's look at the sentence. Okay. So what I want to do is I want us to look at the sentence because as the sentence is written, right? It is not true that it's one plus the longest length of the longest increasing subsequence starting from J. Right. Yeah. So we, yeah, so let's strengthen the sentence and, and strengthen the sentence to say what? Yeah, that includes or starts with. So if you want to force I to be in the sequence, because that's actually what you wanted on your sub problem, I think that's what everyone had in mind, then we just have to strengthen our sentence. Okay, in that case, you have one from using i, and then you're only going to look at the numbers bigger and say j has to be in it, and now what's the longest increasing subsequence using j? This will be correct. Okay, but this process, and then at the end, since you could start from anywhere, you need to include this extra code, right? So now you have something that says, oh, starting from a particular one, what's the longest increasing subsequence, including that first. But of course, anything can start the longest increasing subsequence. So you need to wrap it with a loop. Right? You want to return, you know, you can start anywhere. So you want to loop over all of the indices, return the best one. OK, so that, that is the, the solution. But this process is quite normal. 
Our first sentence was completely reasonable because that was basically the problem. That often works. We tried implementing it, and if you're not careful, you won't be able to justify this step, right? And what we can do though, is we can revisit the sentence, make it stronger, and now you have something stronger for your recursive subcall. Okay, so it's subtle, it's an iterative process, right? So you guys, you gotta identify the first part, and you have to be willing to revisit the first part, the sentence, to solve some of these problems. Really, once you get the sentence, that means you identified the critical substructure. Everything is going to kind of unroll from there. All right. So that was fun. Uh, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I just put that, I, I chose that as an example because then you can kind of see it once before. It shows up again. All those sentences are things that'll show up somewhere in the class, probably. Yeah, that was the same one. That was a yeah. Okay, from here you say, oh, I'm going to use caching. What would the running time of this algorithm be? How many subproblems are there? And subproblems, and how long does each one take? Excluding the recursive subcalls. And Right, because we have this loop. We're looping over at most end indices. Okay. Why is what? Sure. So I have LISI where I is equal to one, two, three, four, up to n. Yes, yes, it's not a consecutive one. Yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah, we can do it. Um, okay. We would say something like, we will prove by induction that LIS implements... Uh, I won't write it out again, but basically the recursive spec, right? So if I can just establish the sentence I really want to show that LIS really does what I say it does for all I. Okay. So, you know, you might say, okay, in the base case, if the sequence is empty, then the answer must be zero. So that's okay. And if there's only one left, the answer is one. You know, you check off the base cases, right? And then you say, okay, now, now in the general case, I is less than N, and I want the length of the longest increasing subsequence of AI to N, starting with I. Right, so I know there's going to be one, and okay, and so so maybe there's two ways, two two directions to go. One is that one is that I'm only you know trying j's that are bigger, and it's returning the length of some subsequence starting with j, that's increasing, right? I know if it's increasing starting from from j, and aj is bigger than ai then I could prepend I and get a feasible solution. So each of these values, all of these one plus LIS of J's over these legal J's, they all represent some valid thing, okay? So whatever value I return will be less than equal to the max because it's definitely legal, like it's a feasible possible length, okay? Now you want the other direction to show you get at least the optimum. And here I say, okay, if I'm just focusing on the longest increasing subsequence starting at with i, that contains i, then it has the one here, and there must be some second letter or not, right? So the not would be, well, if there's not, that's fine. That would just be the empty thing. Otherwise, you know, it's some index j that's bigger than i, and aj is bigger than ai, and that particular recursive call will capture it. It's not too interesting usually once you get the sentence right. Yeah. So so in this case, the algorithm would when it's working on a subproblem at five, 
when it calls a subproblem at seven, it forces seven to be in the solution. So it'll just get two for the problem starting at five. It'll get one for the problem starting at seven. It'll get four for the problem starting at this one, three, two, one. And then at the end, we'll call this loop where I maximize over all the starting points. And that will appropriately find the one starting at one. So there's two answers to this question. One is that our bottleneck is actually just coming from computing this. It's not even coming from this, which takes n time. Once these are all solved, you're just reading off some answers. The second is you got to be careful because, so if I had like an 8 there, I don't know if I had like 8, 9, and then maybe uh, another small number, 5 or something. So from five, you would get an answer of four, seven, eight, nine, five, seven, eight, nine, right? And if I advance four spots, I'll skip over the one. So, so you said like here, right? I start from here. Five, seven, eight, nine. Oh, it's not a consecutive subsequence. It can skip. It can skip, yeah. That would work indeed if it was consecutive. And then you could do it in end time and stuff. That would be very easy. We wouldn't teach that. OK. Sorry, could you say that question again? Yeah. 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 So, yeah, so for example, okay, so I think an example of your thing would be if I had like a 10 here or something, right? So the right answer should, it's supposed to skip 10. Right? You don't want to use 10, because if you use 10, then you throw out all the other. At least for the 5 problem, you want to skip 10. Okay. So you are going to try all j's. Right? So you are going to try, ah, what happens if I choose this one? And then you're going to say, oh, what if I choose this one? And you'll even check this one, but then be like, oh, that's smaller. I can't use it. I can't use it. I can't use it. I can't use it. What if I use this one? Right? So you are taking a maximum over all possible choices. So you don't know really which one you should choose next. You know which ones you could choose next, but it's not obvious what the best one is, right? So, um, uh, No, because, well, so if you are doing a subproblem at 5, then you want to use 7. 7 is bigger than 1, right? You don't want to skip 7. Yes, yes, so this is a loop. Uh, from i plus one, you're only looking forwards. Um, yeah, so you you don't know, it's not obvious which one comes next. Just like edit distance, it wasn't obvious what's the next choice. So we don't think too hard, we just try everything. Somewhere there's some true solution that's choosing some j, or maybe none at all. Okay. So actually, I probably should have included the case of one or one plus li, you know, if there was no valid j's. Right, you should still return one. So this code isn't.
completely right. But uh, setting that aside, um, uh, you know, you really don't know which number comes next, right? Because you know, maybe somewhere, maybe the seven looks appealing, but somewhere down here, there's like a further down, there's like a five point five or something, right? So, so you know, on one hand, seven seems appealing because there's a lot of there's a lot of array left because it's pretty close to the five. But then 5.5 is also smaller, so you, you know there's more numbers bigger potentially than it and stuff, right? So there's trade-offs, and it's not obvious which one to pick. That's why we just exhaust all the possibilities. Just like an edit distance, it wasn't obvious if you should insert first, substitute first, delete first. And you know you can look at the next two characters, next three characters, next four characters. It's not clear that you can get away with not looking at all the things. So we are, you know, the first thing is just trying to get a recursive algorithm that's correct by conservatively basically enumerating all possibilities, trusting induction to work on the sub smaller subproblems. Yeah, hopefully, we'll get a lot of practice with this, and maybe comfort will go up over time. But any more questions about this? These are all good questions. Yeah. Yeah, that's why we got rid of it. Wait, sorry, what's the question? Yeah, because look at what we're trying to do. We're trying to find a length of the longest increasing subsequence that includes i. So you have to use i. That's the one. We strengthened our sentence. It's not exactly what we were originally looking for. To get what we were originally looking for, we need this extra loop. OK, other questions? OK. Um, then what I'll do is I'll start the next topic so that uh...